and welcome to Let's Go Speaks. Today is Tuesday, August something, and this is episode 201. I am Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. I apologize that I sometimes forget to say thank you to all of your faces. Okay, I frequently forget to say thank you to all your faces. But my thanks are on your faces. Do you feel them? They're like tiny butterfly kisses, but those are my thanks. Do you feel them? That's me. Thanking you for being awesome. Thank you! Thank you for watching the show. Thank you for making comments on the thread. Thank you for saying hello to me in the real world, three-dimensional life that we all live. Thank you for contributing to the show financially. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're all awesome sauce. Right. Oh, I forgot to bring the shawl over. I was going to show you the prizes for this th quarter's drawing for folks who've contributed to the podcast via PayPal. What? People do that. They're awesome. I'm also going to put up a Patreon page. Don't worry if you're freaked out. I'm not going to make any exclusive content. I know people don't like that. Don't worry. It's just like as an option. If you support other podcasts or artists via, via Patreon, you can add me into your hooli do and we'll all save on our fees, which is a nice thing. You don't have any fees. We have fees. So I'm just saying. But this quarter, I'll just tell you, this quarter I'm totally going to give away my um, color affection shawl that I showed a couple episodes ago, the finished color affection that's the beautiful gold from um, Marigold Jen. I was like, Jenny the Potter, that's not right. The beautiful gold from Marigold Jen, the beautiful multicolor from Homespun House, and then the beautiful hot pink from um, Hazelnuts. I'm totally giving that away as a prize. And then also some crazy sweater tea towels. Those might be the prizes for the rest of the year because they're really fun. <laughs> well, not the color affection because I can't make another one right now. But anyway, so I'll show you those next time though. So that'll be the prize for contributing to the podcast um, during July, August, and September. Or September. It doesn't have to be all three. It just could be one. But if you give a dollar or more between those times, you'll be entered one or more times to be receiving a prize. That's enough administration. Thank you, though. I don't know where this mug came from. I know that Malia gave it to me, and isn't it the cutest thing ever? Maria rhymes with Maria. Sorry. I said Maria rhymes with Maria, but she knows who she is. She doesn't watch podcasts. <laughs> She's a busy lady. Is it a cat? Okay, so sorry if I'm drinking a bit of tea because it's early still. Okay. We have so much to talk about. Shut up. But there's actually knitting. What? It's true. <laughs> but let's first start with shenanigans, which will contain some from the boards, like very organically. It'll happen. Are you ready? Oh my gosh, apple picking season. <laughs> I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is, I think, zone five on ye old agricultural maps and we have apples yo actually we had apples back in july um the earliest varieties but we just went last weekend the weekend before last weekend <laughs> sorry if i also periodically or i'm scratching so many mosquitoes i went to dry yarn yesterday on the drying rack and literally walked outside onto my porch like and it's like a concrete slab porch. It's like this big. It's big enough for like four people to stand on. It's just like an entryway thing. Went out there, grabbed my yarn, grabbed the, the uh, cowl that was blocked out there, walked back in the house, and had no fewer than five mosquito bites. Some of them were doubles. They were huge. It's ridiculous. So anyway. <laughs> Let's talk about other stuff. Apple picking! <gasps> okay, so I'll put in a video here. So I'm not even sure if you can see how awesome this is, but I'm all down. like I'm just standing inside the tree. Oops, too close. You can't focus on that. <laughs> and you can just see, like, look at that. Look at 
with these apples. They're just everywhere. And these have actually been ripe for a little while now, so it's not like we're it's not like we're the first people to hit these trees. Like this is like okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh my gosh, what? Okay, there should be like a count the beans prize. How many apples do you think are in this picture? Like, look at that. What? I, what? I have not moved my feet. I am just literally turning around. Occasionally you might hear an apple fall. Like we're not wasting apples, but if an apple has a wormhole in it, we cannot take it because I, I'll totally eat an apple with a wormhole in it. That's not the issue. The issue is that that worm will come out of that apple and literally just take a bite of every apple you have. So it's not cool. So hopefully those will just go to fertilize next year's crop. Yes, yeah, see, see how I move my feet, people? Just inside wintry. What? Yeah, that's beautiful. I like it when there's rusting. It's called rusting. Yeah. Yeah, like that. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah. just rough, but it's not. Yeah, it doesn't hurt anything. It's called russeting. I think it makes them really beautiful. Russet, like russet potatoes. Yeah, I get. You know what? I hadn't thought same, about is that. that. The same basic thing. But when you think about the surface of a russet potato, it has that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So either that's a word that means something that I don't know, or they just said, "Oh yeah, that's like a russet potato." ginger golds. The ginger golds are a sweeter apple, but they're pretty good. Pretty good for eating. The Akanis are really one of my favorites, but they are kind of small. So you have some you have some peeling in your life. But that's okay. And so then there, this is part of our orchard. Here we go, we're going across. You'll see next to us there's a bunch of new trees. But our orchard does all dwarf stock. So we can't reach the very tallest of the apples, but we can reach almost all of them. You can see there we go. We're kind of in the middle of a hill looking down. You can see all of the orchard's trees. And I'm walking, so we're gonna what? Oh yeah. Well, just a second, let me do this real quick. So then it's still going. So all those are apples to come. You literally can't see the end of it in either direction. <laughs> it's apple crazy. It's gorgeous. So that's our apples. Aren't they pretty? So then here is their market. You can see all of their apples available to pick. They have local plums. There are plums here from the orchard, which are, I'm not a huge plum person. Maybe I need to learn to like plums more. And then they have their own pears. And then this year they had nectarines. I may have bought those back spaces that are empty. Oops, it's grabbing jam. And then they have their Anderson, their local peaches from this orchard. They also have, so these are the whites, they also have the yellows. And they also sell them as seconds if you wanna do jams or things. So yeah, isn't it cute? And then back there they have more garden produce like corn and peppers and things like that. Hopefully I did that. Um, it's just a tiny little video of us, of the orchard itself. Because oh, it's so cute. So we picked Akani's and Akani's and Ginger Golds. <laughs> Slight size. This is not a very, this is like a smallish one, but there is a serious size difference. The Akani's are much t uh, brighter and a bit more, well, they're more tart and they're brighter 
and the ginger golds are still firm, which I am a huge, I am a firm apple girl. I do not like a, I want the apple to kind of cut me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I want it to be like, oh, you're eating me, but I'm fighting back a little bit. Not as much as pineapple, which will literally eat your mouth. Pineapple enzymes. But a little bit. I like to have a little bit of adventure when I'm eating my apple. I don't want to just be like, oh, I give up. <laughs> There's no joy in that. That is a, that's a hollow victory. Okay, so <laughs> so this one is kind of a smallish one, but it was it was on the counter, so I just grabbed it. And this is a ginger gold. So yay, they had other varieties that were ready. They had Paula Reds, which I do like, but are softer. And they had this new one. What was it called? Shoot. It's called like Red Rush or something like that. And it was garbage. <laughs> It was a new variety for them, and it had a great texture. Maybe it'll get better as it ripens more because it had just come into the window, but it had like zero flavor. It was, it's why people don't like apples, yo. I mean, you're allowed to not like apples if you just don't like apples, but a lot of you don't like apples because you ate, not you specifically, I mean the human race. If you're watching this, you've probably tried an apple before, <laughs> like a good one. Um, but like, again, our exposure to apples is all like red delicious. I love apples. Love them. Last time I ate a red delicious, was I seven? That's not true. I totally ate a red delicious from our orchard, which was surprisingly good. What? Okay, I have to go let the dogs in. Back. Oh, the red delicious. Yeah, like randomly, that was a good apple though. I mean, I was, I mean, it was not like a favorite apple, that red delicious I tried from the orchard. But I would eat another one. But that red delicious that comes in the three pound bag. Totally not eating it. Not happening. Anyway. <laughs> so we totally picked apples, yay. Apple picking makes me insanely happy. I really told my family, I tried to psych them up before we left, that we were only going to pick a half bushel, which is a big bag. Which is like as much as you want to carry, quite frankly. So I don't have a half bushel bag here, but it's like this big-ish. It's big, right? So I really tried to talk them into only be, we still ended up with a bushel. We need to just get a cider press. Like, I just need to make my fat squirrel hard cider and that'll be my, it'll be bootleg because I don't think I can be regulated. But I'll just make some bootleg hard cider. <laughs> oh my gosh. By the way, this is not the organic from the boards, but it happens to be the organic from the boards. So, so many of you commented that you enjoyed the River Cottage series on the, either the Amazon, which you pay for, or the YouTube, which you get for free. I'm not, I don't know what's going on there, but it's not mine. One of the episodes, he totally goes to a cider club, which is this thing, apparently. What is going on with you, UK? Why are you so amazing? Do we have cider clubs? I guess I should check it out. I just don't feel like I've, we do, because it feels like there would be a regulation. Regulations are good for many reasons. Not on what things I want, though. <laughs> Anyway, so they have this cider club, and they all, like these, it's apparently all men. Mine is going to be lots of ladies. But, not that men are not allowed, but I'm recruiting in the lady quarters. So, it's this group of dudes, and they go out and they gather all the windfall, ap windfall apples from, I don't know if it's like an orchard that somebody knows somebody or whatever, but they go gather all the windfalls, which, again, the company, the... Lots of orchards can't make enough use of all their windfalls. So it's just, if you can like actually go gather them, like the labor it takes to gather them is worth them just giving them to you. Because sometimes they don't really break even on those, but sometimes they do. I don't know what's going on. They are the dudes, and they're all, the majority of them are older gentlemen. Like I would say the at least 75% of them are like in the um, 50 plus age range. I know I'm getting there really closely. I'm going to start saying older. <laughs> Still slightly older than me, though. Um, and so they go out and they gather all the windfall apples and they bring them back to their, like, cider club. 
And they have a giant old cider press and they do the whole process there and then they make their own cider, which apparently is like, what did he say? Was like 15% a ABV? Was it that high? Like our store cider in the US is like maybe six. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a seven even. It's like six and a half is really where it maxes out. What are they doing to that cider? Is that what they call scrumpy? That happens too. I don't know what that is, but I feel like I saw that on one of the Edwardian farm, Victorian farm. Oh my gosh, UK! Much better we are. And there's sheep everywhere. I know the grass is greener, but like, have you seen it? It's actually greener. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So I, so that's all to say that clearly I need to buy a stinking cider press so that I can make hard cider in my sketchy basement for the hobo who lives down there. He can be overpowered if he's like all scrumped up on scrumpy. Just saying. But so, that's what he's happening. Because we can't not put, pick, like, by the way, a half bushel of apples is at least 25 pounds. I feel like ours are like 30 because they're heavy, yo. And you have to carry them like super gingerly, like they're giant fat babies because you don't want to get pressure bruises all over your apples, which I will admit I got a few on because I left them in my van for a few days. I know, right? I just couldn't deal with how many apples there were. Why is my family so crazy? I was there with them. It was totally my fault too. Don't they know they need to rein me in sometimes? That's kind of their job. Could they also just, I wouldn't even care if they would just like eat some apple butter. My husband will not even eat an apple unless it's in crisp form. Anyway, cider press. I'm going to start looking on Craig's list. Also, how fun would it be to make your own cider? Day drinking all day long. I got to use up these apples, people. <laughs> anyway. So we did apples and then we also at the orchard purchased, we, they do not let you do you pick for their um, nectarines and peaches, but they do have their own trees there. So nectarine jam time. Um, what's the difference between a nectarine and a peach? If you don't know, peach is fuzzy, nectarine is slick. You can actually, um, when you're canning, you don't even have to take the skin off the nectarines because it has pectin in it and it cooks down so soft that it's not problematic in the jam. Whereas I guess the peach fuzz probably Hairy jam. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's fine. Whatever. I don't judge. It's fine. Uh, but and then also the nectarine is slightly got, uh, slightly got. Has a slightly sharper note. I mean, it's not tart by any stretch of the imagination, but it just has a little bit more oomph to it. So if you add ginger to that, delicious. So this year I did an experiment. I did um, one batch as directed by the ball. Is it ball that makes that? Now that I say that, I'm not sure. But anyway, they make that low sugar pectin that I showed you before in the little jar. So I made, this is the batch that's that way. And I made it as directed with the correct amount of sugar, even though it's way too much for my palate, but whatever, and canned those. But then I also, this was the organic thing that happened, which now doesn't feel so organic, but whatever. From the boards, not organic style. Still a little bit. <laughs> twin set is it Jan or Ellen twin set Ellen who of course is of the twin set audio podcast check them out um is super cute both of them are super cute oh, they're twins. that doesn't make them cute I'm just saying that they're both whatever you get it right okay sorry anyway of course I love you people like one time I was talking about some weird astrophysics concept that like we're only a reflection of like a, what's on the Van Horizon of a black hole and somebody totally wrote in and was like yes I'm an astrophysicist blah 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 what y'all are awesome anyway twins that Ellen used to work for um so she actually says it here's Progresso I think right yeah Progresso soups and so she was talking about canning because this this was in episode 199 when I think I was talking about maybe I was talking about strawberry jam or something where it was so sweet and she goes into good length about like 
And so I was bemoaning the lack of like real scientific information out there. By the way, there actually is more information and lots of you wrote in. I should compile, a, I need to do that. I'm gonna put it up to myself. To compile a list of resources that p people have sent in from like their county extension offices and stuff like that about canning. So anyway, so don't be afraid of canning. It's awesome. Just follow a recipe. But like if you, sw if you stray from a recipe, it's not like cooking on, it's not like dinner cooking, okay? Straying up from a recipe is, be cautious. Don't, just don't do it. I said don't do it, but I do do it sometimes. <laughs> but I'm telling you not to, you know what I mean? FDA, don't come get me. Anyway. <laughs> oh shoot, I just backed out of it or something. So she was right. She was basically saying that too, that she thinks that the reason that we don't see that much information on the canning is because of people being afraid to give anybody too much of a leash because people just go crazy. So she says, my, so my theory is that discussing the science is avoided by some authors because they'd hate to inadvertently suggest one should experiment at home. Sure, people have canned at home forever and tweaked recipes and processing times and very few have died, but some have, and those are almost always ones who went off the beaten path too far. Okay, so she's just reiterating what we all know. Canning at home is very, very safe. Very, very safe. As long as you follow directions. But then she goes on to say, it would be great if the science were explained well enough so we'd have a better idea of the real limits, which is what I'm always looking for. But it's really complicated. I haven't gotten, even got, so she had talked before about like heat temperature curves, like heat time curves, and like putting probes and things because, you know, your um, higher acidity foods, your high sugar foods are safer or are, are, are more forgiving in terms of like they are less likely to harbor bacterium because the sugar is a preservative in terms of like preventing growth of bacteria. Plus the acidity in the fruit is, so you have like a combination working for you. However, when you're canning things like pressure canning, so right, so we have like hot water bath canning, which is foods that are higher in acidity or higher in sugar because, and they're safer, they're, they don't have to be canned under pressure, which means that when you can something under pressure, it's going above the boiling temperature because you've put it under pressure. And that's the whole point of pressure canning is that you can get those foods up to above a boiling temperature without all the water boiling off and not working. So, so when you're pressure canning, when you're pre pressure canning and you're doing foods like beans and meats and things like that, there's much less, there is no room. There's no room for experimentation of those at all. Um, so I don't do pressure. I don't even have a pressure canner. My grandma says she let me have hers. She has more than one. But anyway, so yes. Oh, so she hasn't even talked, so then she says, I haven't even gotten into the impact of mixing on heating, right? Which makes a huge difference, right? Your, your ingredients on the outside of the can are getting more exposure to the hot water bath, especially in pressure canning, where the, temp, the food that you're putting into the thing is not up as high to temp because the pressure canning is taking it there. Your stove can't take it there. The pressure canner has to take it there. Um, so the effects of stir mixing on heating and what ingredients are more likely to carry sporm forming bacteria, which are the harder to kill bacteria, or how acidity affects the amount of time needed to kill, or how headspace affects the heating, so that's the, the space between the lid of the jar and the food that's in the jar. And then she goes on to say that that's just totally her theory, that that's why we don't hear about it, but yeah. Ellen, it's my theory too, so I think we're totally right. No questions about it. Just saying. Not just because they agree with me <laughs> and have more information and real reasons to do so. <laughs> but so I made one in the regular, like the prescribed Bible method. But then the other ones I did go off the bean bath, but I froze them. So I made one batch. So then I made another batch with, um, that actually is kind of like the, the low sugar recipe for the, the low sugar pectin, but actually slightly less sugar, um, and added, this one has ginger in it. I felt like that was a safe addition because the ball canning, like the actual ball book of canning has a recipe for apricot with ginger and bourbon. And I did ginger last time and it, it worked really well. 
So just, you could either use candy ginger or fresh ginger, but fresh ginger packs a bigger punch. And if you don't like to grate ginger or you're afraid of getting strings or whatever, you can buy that like tube of ginger and that's wicked convenient. I never use that whole tube like when I'm just making regular food because we don't use ginger that much. But in this instance, I do buy that tube of ginger, which you get in like the refrigerator section of your grocery store, like where the herbs are, because it's so easy. And I use the whole thing when I'm making the ginger nectarine jam. So I froze the ones that I went off grid for. Cause you know, you can free, free, freeze fruit just as is. So I feel like it's pretty safe. Um, and then of course we'll just use those, we'll keep those refrigerated and use them more rapidly than we would normally worry about using these guys. Was that a more information that you really wanted? Of course it was, that's why you come here. Ding, <laughs> should be my tagline. More information than you wanted on everything. Probably not completely accurate. The information, whatever. Then also, <laughs> we made pickles. Okay, I don't wanna say we, I made pickles. These people are losers and don't even eat pickles. But so a friend gave me a bunch of cucumbers from her patch and then I bought some more at the market and I was feeling really pressured because <laughs> that's a canning pun. But I was feeling all this pressure because I had a lot of um, work deadlines happening and there was all of sickness and like a whole lot of stuff. So I was feeling like really pressured about getting these canned up. Um, and so I decided just to do refrigerator pickles because it was only five pounds of pickle, five pounds of cucumbers, I think. So I just did the refrigerator recipe and they are so good. Last year I made um, sweet pickles according to the what is her name? She does the, f it's like her name is like bandwagon, but that's not right. <laughs> so but anyway, so she did, I did that recipe and I didn't, I mean, I, I grew to the place where I would accepted those pickles and I'm not gone through all of them, but we're doing pretty good. Um, again, I'm doing pretty good. Nobody else eats pickles in this house. But I was not a fan of the more complex flavors. I just gotta be honest with you. So I did these this year and I totally dig them. They're just straight up. They're from the Brown Eyed Baker. So you basically just salt your pickles to get the, them to sweat out a little bit. Then you rinse them. Then you do a sugar brine, sugar vinegar brine. And it does have a little bit of spice like mustard seed and things like that. Um, has a little bit of, and of course it has sugar. And so mustard seed, celery seed, and turmeric are the only um, spices. And then of course you add onion and bell pepper. And then I added some spice, some hot peppers as well. They're not very spicy, but I could always throw, see that's the other thing that's awesome about refrigerator pickles. I could just like throw in some, I should have thought about that, some dried pepper flakes or something. Um, and you just need to use them within four to six weeks super crunchy and super delicious and I'm digging them so yay that but now let's talk about yarn stuff I finished so much spinning in fact it's actually still sort of damp here is eight ounces this is one ply of knit spin farm in the drinking swearing fencing and one ply of spun right round in the, sorry, it's drinking, fencing, swearing from Knit Spin Farm. And this is a flock together. So the Knit Spin Farm ply is Superwash Tarhi, and the spun right round ply is Rimboulet. And it's super cute and fluffy and fun. And so not my normal colorways, but the yellow made it happen. Still, still not, well, it's still not dry completely. So this is eight ounces of a two ply and it's about 737 yards. So it's like a fingering-ish weight, which is actually pretty good for me. I'm a super fat spinner. Hmm. I'm also a super fat drawer. Until I matches my shirt, I plan it that way. So I can't say much enough good things about both Knit Spin Farm and Spun Right Round. I've always had great, great fiber from them. It's very enjoyable. Then I have a bonko skein of um, Hello Yarn. 
This is a patchwork kilt. K kilt? This is a patchwork kit that I chain plied. Oh, let's see here. What? That's a lot of my tattoo. All right. <laughs> So a patchwork kit, I keep saying kilt, what is that? It's just like a big bag of her ends from when she does club fiber. Right, look at that gold. So they're just like ends, they're, so they're all different fiber contents, all different colorways, but she picks ones that she thinks like go. And of course she has a great color sense and this is amazing. Now, I thought it was 12 ounces, but then I realized that I took some of it, um, some of the bumps out to do with spindle spinning. So I need to get those. I'm not a huge spindle spinner, but I really want to be because I find it aesthetically very pleasing. Um, so I have some spindles that are, are getting close to having their, so I mean, I have probably, and then I did take out one bump of just like a solid gray because quite frankly, it was the last bump of, of fluff that I was supposed to spin and I was just like, I'm done now. <laughs> and it was solid, like dove gray, you know what I mean? So I was just like, put that aside, maybe I'll use it for something else. So I, it's definitely not the full pound, even though you get a pound of fiber. I think it's about 12 ounces. And then again, I've got little bits left over or on spindles to do. So I think it's about 12 ounces and I got 737 yards and it's definitely like, I would say a DK. It's really pretty. So originally I thought I would just do a couple of foolproofs with it. That's still definitely an option, but I'm not gonna lie to you, I have thought about doing another poncho. Maybe an excuse me one. I don't know, that's crazy. Maybe just a brioche poncho, but let me like, look at that golden green stuff. By the way, I am not in any way the most uh, consistent or awesome spinner. I totally spin semi woolen and then to try to chain ply it, there's times where I'm like, what have I done? Because I don't put a ton of twist in my singles. Uh, but it works out. It'll, the singles only broke, you know. I mean, really, the singles probably only broke half a dozen times or so, which is not bad. Oh, it is really pretty, though. <laughs> so those are actually still damp. They're still drying. I washed them yesterday. And then I have an actual knitting finish project. What? Object. Project. Same thing. I finished my... I have to get the pattern out because I can't remember what it's called. It's a down river. Yes, down river cowl by Joan Forgione. Sorry, Joan, you're not watching this, but I'm still sorry. I'm putting it in the ether. And it's by Paper Moon Knits. And this picture is not the greatest. It's very dark, but that's what it is. I used um, shepherd's wool that I purchased at a festival, and this is what I had left. I'll put the colorway names in the show notes because I apologize. I don't have the tags right now. So I have this much left. So I'm sorry. It's a worsted weight cowl for two colors. Actually, you know, it might be DK. I'm not sure, but whatever. You know what I mean. And the, the, I did block it on wires, so I did block it. I did not block it, I would not say aggressively, but I did block it firmly. But boy, it just really opened up so nicely. The UPS man is coming. Hopefully he's not coming to my house. I love these colors together, this like kind of smoky, dirty teal and gold. It was totally what was in that Hello Yarn thing. <laughs> this was very fun and a very pleasant knit. 
if you're looking for something like on a bigger gauge, because I, for me, I have occasionally need um, like a worsted or it's just a loose gauge project um, for my hands. So it was great for that. It can use, you know, you can use up two random skeins of worsted weight yarn or DK, whatever. And it's got a little bit of a potato chip factor because again, oh, the pattern is written has a cast on of the, what would be the yellow and a bind off with the yellow. I just didn't because I was lazy. <laughs> but so you see a very short um, chunks of each texture, but the texture repeats, even the lace one are very basic um, and do not have a ton of stitches in them. And it just gives it a nice, Again, it has that nice potato chip feel because you're just you're just going to do something for a little while, but then you're going to change it. But it's not a complicated change. Like there have been some patterns where I knew I was going to change and I was like dreading it because I thought, oh gosh, now I have to learn a new repeat. But this is definitely not that way. It's very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. And again, very, fairly quick too. So that's much what's, what's, what's left. What's left? Okay, so then I have another finished object, and hopefully I'll put a picture in here. Did I remember? So those are a pair of lambing mitts, which is a free pattern that you can find on the Tolt Yarn website. Uh, their blog, excuse me, but if you just Google lambing mitts, lambing mitts, they will come up. They are written for piece fleece, and in fact, the reason I made those, those are for my stepfather, for my mother's husband, and here's just one here. I'm making so much noise, sorry. These are like one of my most worn mitts that I have ever made. They are the most worn. They're not one of them. Um, so this one is in Peace Fleece. I don't know what color this is. Shoshanka Green. I'm making that up, literally. That's not what it is. Um, but they are my most worn, by far. Because you can wear them flipped up like this. So if your hands are cold, but if you're actually needing to do something, you can flip them down. So as written, you would want to use a heavy worsted or an Aran weight. I think, I think Peace Fleece is listed as Aran. Um, and there's three sizes. There's a small, a medium, and a large. Uh, the ones I am sh that I just showed you in that picture are the size large. The yarn that I used is the Beaver Slide Dry Goods. It's their two-ply sport. And I held it double. And that worked out quite nicely. Um, I knit those on US fives. So what I originally knit, these were, those were a gift, as I said. So originally I, I was like, I can't just give somebody mitts that are not hand spun at least, you know? So I had this crazy kooky skein of hand spun and really I love the colors in it, but I was, it was felted like, the, and I don't even know who did the fiber, but it's somebody that I've never purchased from again. I do know who it was. She was a local person and this was, um, this was her roving. So it was not combed top. It was actual roving, which is very hard to dye without felting. Um, but so she's no longer even in business. So no worries. Uh, but I still spun it up because I had like, I think this is like eight ounces. Maybe this is 12 ounces. I don't even know, but it was a lot. It was a significant amount, probably eight ounces. But I had sat in the skein because I just like, was like, pfft. I love those colors, but that yarn looks like garbage. So I thought I was lurk, lurk, lurking. I was lurking in my stash. And I thought, well, maybe I should just try it because it was the right weight and it wasn't, you know, overly feminine colors. Dude, even your cruddy hand spoon looks pretty good knit up. Like, it looks really good. But so I made this one and then I thought like, that's too busy to give him. So that's why I did the, the two, two plies of the beaver slide. And I love beaver slide dry goods. If you're newer to the podcast, actually, if you've been here for a while, even like, I think my first year was my total crush on beaver slide dry goods where I made like everything. 
it's really affordable. Um, they're, they own, they have their own flocks you're buying from the maker, you know, I mean, they're not spinning the wool, but they, you know, it's all them. Um, so, and their yarn is very soft and very affordable. It does have a mohair content, which strengthens it because it is a woolen spun yarn, which is another reason I really love it. I love woolen spun yarns. I'm not saying that I don't like worsted or worsted spun, which is like everything's behind me, but Woolen well, Spun definitely has my heart, like intensely. I know some people don't like it because it's like scratchier or they feel like it breaks more because there's less twist in each ply. Um, but once it's knit up like a Lopi, Lopi is just, it doesn't even have twist in it. It's like a pin drafted Rove almost. Okay, it has a tiny bit. But you can pull, but Lopi sweaters last forever because the combination of the longer fiber the longer staple length and then the strength of actually knitting it. A knitted product is much stronger than the yarn it's made from. So what was that to say? I don't know. That was to say something. I love woolen spun yarns. <laughs> they just can't be beat for warmth. Warmth is the huge, I mean, I love the texture of them. I love um, a dyed in the wool process. I love the way that that kind of makes a heathered yarn. That's so beautiful. Um, But the warmth is the huge factor. The warmth and the lightness, like a wor like for example, um, a sweater made out of Madeline Tosh Vintage versus a sweater made out of Beaver Slide or Peace Fleece or or Barrett Wool. Um, you know any of these wonderful wool and spun yarns is so much lighter, and therefore, and it has more tooth to it. So the fiber itself is less likely to stretch out of place. They are not superwash, and I understand that people like to have the convenience of superwash. But I mean, I don't wash my... <laughs> confession. I don't wash my sweaters that often, so to wash them by hand is not problematic for me, personally, but I understand some people don't want that. Um, so they're not superwash. I, I don't think anybody... I can't think of anybody who has a woolen spun that is superwash. I don't think it would work because you would remove the scales which would hold it together in the looser spun single. Um, and some people don't like them because to, pl to get them to be stronger, folks will add mohair to them, which some people don't like the feel of. Um, or some people will um, ply them slightly tighter, like piece fleece. Uh, and some people don't like to work with piece fleece because it wants to kind of kink up on itself as you're working sometimes. But those things are secondary to me. Um, so yeah, so, so that's all to say <laughs> that woolen spun yarns are great for accessories, uh, where you need warmth, but not a lot of weight, but even better for sweaters where you need warmth, but not a lot of weight. So, but these are the hand spun ones. These are not done yet. These are just to the, oh gosh, point. That yarn looked like garbage. It didn't look like garbage, but didn't look great. That looks totally great knit up. So it's yet another good reason to knit with your hands, but and then again, you can flip them down. I need to do the thumb still. So I have that much of that one done, and then just a wee bit of another one. So these are knitting on US fives, and I knit the size large. Did I say that? I apologize if I did not. There was a big rant in the middle that I wasn't prepared to do. <laughs> I should totally do a uh, like mini episode on woolen versus worsted spun yarns. So again, please don't misunderstand me. I love all of the beautiful hand dyes. I love commercial sock yarn. I mean, I love all the yarns, but I just feel like it's like the woolen spun is the underdog. You know what I mean? Like you just have to give it a little bit more boost because not everybody wants to embrace it, and so I feel like I need to be its advocate. So I love other yarns too, but I that woolen yarn is scrappy. You gotta get in there, wrangle with those worsted buns. <laughs> what am I doing? I don't even know. But that's one thing I have in progress, and a finished, and then a, and a work in progress. And then the next thing I showed you a little bit last week, but I have actually, I ripped apart my sock and started over with the correct stitch count. 
So this is my bootstrap sock, which is from Sark Sock Architecture by Laura Nelkin. And this is Hazel Knits Artisan Sock in the Penny Loafer colorway. And you'll see it when I actually have them blocked for you to see, but there's just this great little garter stitch rib that goes down and stops before you get to the bottom of the heel. But the heel is a fun construction, which has like, a, it's just like a little pocket heel. So you don't get um, a big um, instep increase. You see, of course, you have more depth because of the heel. But I would say it is, well, it's not similar to the fit of a... It's more similar, I think, to the fit of the Spacious OMG heel, or the OMG heel, which is by Megan of Stockinette Zombies, and now of Knit Cahoots, because she's so fancy. Uh, but it has like that pop characteristic, where your heel just kind of pops into it. Um, so, and it even kind of lays similarly. Sorry about that, I need to charge the camera. So in the six, this is a 64 stitch, and I knit this on carbon double points, carbons double points. They are my, by far, they're not my favorite double point. They're the only double point I'm interested in, <laughs> size zeros. And so this is how much I have at the second one. For the 64 stitch sock, you're really just kitchenering five, I think it's like five stitches down here, and then you pick up um, for this part of the, the sole of the sock. Um, so you do have two ends to weave in for the heel, and then, of course, your toe and cuff ends. It's picking up as, like, super stripey in person. It doesn't look that stripey. Very enjoyable. And I love the Hazel Knits Artisan Sock. It is one of my favorite sock yarns. This is in a knit spin farm bag. Knit Spin Farm. That's in a Knit Spin Farm bag, which I'm about to show you. This is one of my bags. <laughs> Sometimes if I have multiple small projects going at once, I like to just keep them in a large wedge because it's just easier. Okay, so then one thing to show you that you've seen before. This is my Bristol Ivy Weights cardigan. So W-A-I-T-S. It is knit with Vulmisa lace, and I'll have the colorways in the show notes. One of them is Campari orange, one of them is another drinky sounding thing. So right, I'm doing so well. I have just the butt to finish, <laughs> but I wanted to show you before I finish it because you can see, like you're just knitting, like once you get to the armpit, you're just like kind of knitting this square into the bottom point. So it's really a fun construction. So even though there's lots of stockinette in the back, you're constantly having less. Like once you get past your armholes, you constantly have less stockinette. In fact, you have less stitches in, in entirety. Um, but yeah, so I'm still deciding. Um, I'll decide once I actually get that body part finished and tried on. I definitely don't think I'm going to do a full sleeve. The question will be, do I do a cap sleeve, which is what's already there, and just bind it off? There's a fruit fly in the house. Or uh, do I do like an elbow link sleeve? So I'm not sure yet, but it's very fun. <laughs> and of course, those yarns are held double, if I didn't mention that. This is two strands of lace weight because the pattern is written for sport. Uh, my gauge is more of a DK, so I'm doing a couple sizes down, I think, is what I did. So yeah, yay that's very close to finishing the body. It's not too bad. I cast that on shortly before SSK. So I think I cast that on like the first week of July or the second week of July. And then the last thing I have to show you is a new project, which I started uh, last night, foolishly, because it's very dark. But this is the Hap B bonnet. So hap like a hap, I guess. H-A-P-B-E-E, -E, hap B bonnet. And it is by Katrin or Katrin Schubert. It is a pay for pattern. And I don't think I have a good picture of it without showing you the pattern itself. It's brioche. Right. 
So it's reversible. That would be technically the wrong side of hers. Okay, let's see if you can see any of this because it is very dark at the beginning. So the pattern is written for sport weight. I, I think my single that I'm using technically could be a sport weight, but for some reason before I started knitting, I thought it was fingering weight. So I chose a fingering weight yarn to go with it. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I do like it, but boy, it was hard to see at the beginning. So I chose um, a ball of quince. And I'm just not sure what the colorway name is because it was already, like it was what I used for my um, Exploration Station shawl. But it's a fingering weight, Quinson Yarn Company. Uh, it's navy blue. And then I have this skein of hand spun singles from Hobbledehoy, which I also don't have a tag for. <laughs> oh, no, wait, I do. I'm a good person. Halfway. <laughs> so these were Hobbledehoy Batlings in the per Paranormal Romance colorway, which I purchased last year at SSK, or I traded for last year. So right. Ugh. So don't you think that'll be, clearly I picked navy just because I wanted the navy and that like acid green to be together. I may have also bought yarn for this hat and just decided not to use it. <laughs> But I feel like I wanted to co-opt it into another hat for myself, so it's not terrible, right? It is terrible. Um, but what I'm actually doing is I have way more of this than I you need for this little tiny baby bonnet. Um, so I'm actually breaking the colors. So like I have a chunk of this purple, which I'm like the whole hat would have been half of the hat would have been purple. So I didn't want that. So I'm just gonna do like five-ish ish rows in each color so that I get the full gradation, which I think is why I wanted to make it. Dude, brioche. You got me, brioche. So enjoyable. Oh, so because I am knitting it at more of a fingering weight size, I'm knitting it on US 1s, um, 2.25 millimeters. I did knit the largest size and just counting, you know, so that it would be and I think that's about to be, and it's super stretchy because it's Brio Show. What? So I'm very excited about it. I When I cast it on last night, I had a little bit of the black and the navy together, and I was like, what have I done? Why did I cast this on after dark? What was I thinking? But after I got past that bit, it was, now I'm into Brio Chef him. Brio is so enjoyable, yo. So enjoyable. <laughs> And it's also so squishy, okay, okay. Tiny hat. So, there's that. Okay. So what? A so I might actually take what's left, because I mean, again, I'm using a very small fraction of this, and it's only two ounces of this hand spun anyway. Um, but I actually, I'm probably gonna make a hat with the other parts because it's so pleasant to me. <laughs> okay, so now, it's all about shameless self-promotion, people. So if you're not interested, if it's not the season for you to buy a knitting bag, I totally understand. I feel your pain. Well, maybe it's not your pain. Maybe you're like, no, really, I'm not ever interested in it being that season. That's okay. Please don't tell me that in a snarky way, though, because that would not be nice. <laughs> Somebody wrote a snarky comment on the, the YouTube comments, and I don't know why, it totally bugged me totally bugged me so I was so thankful like three or four of you then commented after that so that it like bumped it off my screen where I could no longer see it when I went <laughs> why do I care it still bothers me anyway and I don't mean like bothers me deep dark at night time I just mean like ah thorn briar bother okay so the next update will be a fair update and that will be on, I'm so glad I looked at the date because I totally thought it, it'll be on August 18th, which is a Friday at 9 p.m. And then the next update will be Halloween, which will be August 25th, 
also at 9 p.m. I'm regretting not having just combined those into one, but that's okay. So the first step, the first bags I show you will be in the fair update. Are you ready? Right? This one is available in sweater and large wedge. But look! Oh, okay, so you got bee scaps, you got ducks, there's sheep on some, there's mallards on some, there's quilts on some, sunflowers on, I think, all of them. There's cows, there's turkeys, there's pigs. What? But even better, and like all the vegetables, but do you see the ribbons? Do you see all the ribbons you want at the fair? Those are totally your ribbons, you want those. It's for your knitting that's inside this bag. Here's one of those sleepy pigs. So cute. Then, You're like, that's not enough pig for me. I'm like, I got you. I got you. Right. Look at this one. Also with the ribbons for your knitting. How cute is that? Right? Okay, though, I apologize. The lights are kind of washing out the pigs. The pigs are not white. They are pink. Try to bring it back. <laughs> it's got pie on it. And this, that one's available in both the sock plus and the small wedge size. Small wedge is perfect for one skein projects like mittens or if you're using um, single point needles doing small projects because they'll fit in there very easily. Uh, the zipper opening is at least 13 inches. Um, so I use this for sometime, I use it definitely for socks, especially when I'm doing double points. I like the slightly bigger zipper opening than what is available on my smallest size bag. So I definitely use this one for socks, but I also use this one for like hats. But if I'm doing like a two color hat, or again, uh, something on longer needles, or a one skein shawl, or a cowl, or something like that, I will use this because I just enjoy the bigger, I don't like to have to cram my knitting into stuff. Do you know what I mean? Cram. And then, also in the fair update, Fair food. What? So this one is only available in the sock plus size, but it's all the fair food signs, yo. You could also take this one to Rhinebeck because they totally got all these things, okay? Rhinebeck is coming. What? So if you need a bag for your love of corn dogs and elephant ears and nachos, just saying. Okay, now the next update is all Halloween. So that'll be August 25th at 9 p.m. And these are all ready to sew, so they'll all go out lickety split. They're all ready to go, not ready to sew. They're all sewn, or will be by then. <sighs> okay, are you ready? Okay, for Sock Plus. Oh my gosh, what is up with you cute ghosties? the riding skateboards mommy ghosty is like you better wear this shirt and baby ghosty's like no ha 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 that's why we have uniforms mama ghosty somebody's riding a skateboard somebody's doing their homework what? Super cute. Okay. in the small wedge size <gasps> what? we got our crows we got our cats we got our gourds we got everything we need Okay. Okay. All right. How cute is that? Orange zipper. Hi. It's my favorite orange zipper season. <laughs> Enlarge wedge. Ah! What? How much do I love this, like... I know what color this is. It's like swamp gold. The swamp gold with the teal and the blue. Oh, it breaks my face. It's basically like Quincy Company's honey colorway with aqua. My favorite thing ever. Hmm. 
So cutesy little ghosty town. Okay. You're like, that's cute, but it's not that cute enough. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I got you. Super cute. What? Also large wedge. Everything's got a face. Including, is it on here? Oh, no, it's not on this one. Including the apple bobbing bucket. What? The apple bobbing barrel totally has a face on it. He's happy, by the way. He's totally enjoying it. She, however, is not feeling it. Right. So cute. There's a little Dracula dude. There's a little zombie gal. There's a Ouija board that looks happy to be there. What? Look how cute that is. Super simple graphic. I love that just simplified line style. They got a kitty cat and some witchy potions brewing up, some jars of eyeballs, as you do, some happy mushrooms, all of your herbs going. Very enjoyable. Then, fat witches, yo. Now, I'm putting this in the Halloween update, but this is a year-round bag. What is up with all these fat witches? I think she's my my favorite fat witch. Do you see her? She's got like hot pants. She's like roller. She's like a roller derby fat witch. She's super cutie. I love her. But I do enjoy all of them. By the way, I do feel like I need to point out these two gals right here. Now see, you can't see it as much because the camera's washing it out. That's not their boobs. That's their knees. So in case you just are looking at the update and you're like, those are their knees. Not their naked boobs. I probably would have still bought it if it had been their naked boobs though. I might have bought more of it, I'm not sure. <laughs> so then if you're like super committed to Halloween and you like a big project, This is, this, is, this is super committed to the spooky lifestyle. I would not say this is just Halloween. This is spooky lifestyle. This is year round. We have all these fun jars, great colors, this like nice warm charcoal. So it definitely has a brown undertone to it. You have your sea of lost souls with this awesome green. Ugh. Slug slime. What? Your toadstool and your drink. I think those are all the things. So again, if you've hung around this long, thanks ladies and gents. You're super awesome. And I will see you next time. Bye.